Hi, this is the first of four video on how to make a large format contact print, in this case an 8x10 contact print. In this first video we're going to see how to expose the negative, so how to actually make the proper picture, but then there is still a lot of work to do to get to a final print. And uh, in the second video we're going to see how to develop the negative, in the third video how to make the actual contact print, and in the fourth and final video, how to finish and frame the print. So let's get right into it. Shooting large format film allows for unparalleled sharpness and smoothness of tonalities, but it is a long and laborious process that actually starts way before the shutter is triggered and the negative exposed. First, the film must be loaded into the film holder. The holder is a light tight container that can store two pieces of film, one per side, protected by two dark slides. Loading film is easy, but a few factors should be considered. One is dust. When loading film, dust is the enemy. Excessive dust deposits on the film and results in black spots in the final image that are very difficult to correct. So it is a good idea to always remove dust with an anti-static brush and to store the loaded holder into a Ziploc bag or another clean container. Another issue that can arise when loading film is that the film has to be properly seated into the holder. It has to be inserted below the two grooves, the two notches, that runs on the side of the holder. The film is contained in a light tight triple box. It has to be handled in complete darkness but I am demonstrating it here in the light with an already developed piece of film. Once the film is loaded, uh, we can finally get out and uh, start to think about taking the image in this case the subject is a bridge that uh, is actually only five minutes away from my home in Pittsburgh and thus I just loaded everything into my, my backpack uh, and headed off on my bike. I personally choose a pretty lightweight uh, setup for 8x10, sacrificing maybe a little bit of precision and a little bit of uh, brightness and ease when uh, composing by having a very lightweight and uh, easy setup to carry around and I actually have a link up here to a video where I describe in detail my uh, pretty lightweight 8x10 setup. When I arrive to the location the first thing that I do is to try to find most accurately as possible the place where to put the tripod because it's always a pain to move the tripod with the large and cumbersome 8x10 on top. If you notice, uh, the tripod doesn't have a center column, and this is to give extra stability uh, to the large camera. It basically acts as a sail in the wind with all the bellows deployed. It's finally time to take the camera out of the bag making sure that uh, the film holder and the dark cloth stay away from the dirt. The camera is placed on the tripod head and secured with a clamp. And by the way, I'm sorry if all these uh, camera shots are at an angle from low to high. The tripod for my large format camera is just so much taller than all my other tripods. And then the rear standard is raised and the front starter is the screwed in on the camera bed. At this point I make sure that everything is nice and centered and all the camera movements are zeroed out. For this particular shot the lens is a Fujinon A 240mm f9 lens. 240mm may sound like a very long lens but this is actually a moderate uh, wide angle lens, equivalent to about uh, 30 to 35 mm on a full frame camera. And uh, F9, yes, this lens is very dim, 
but at the same time this makes it very compact in fact it's only 200 grams which is tiny for a lens that covers 8 by 10 with the room to spare and it's extremely sharp anyway the lens is secured to the front standard and dust off just to remove any contaminants the dark cloth allows to see the dim image on the ground glass of the camera and the image is upside down and reversed which is kind of difficult to deal with at the beginning but then the brain gets used to it and it actually can aid in composition at this point the dance of movements begins we have three-way knobs to frame the proper composition and then we have another knob on the camera to adjust the focusing of the camera and we can take a look in the ground glass until the image comes to focus the composition is further refined until it's uh, set and it's time for the final focus adjustment for this step I use a 10x loop which is a very powerful loop that allows me the most critical focus adjustment I think it is interesting to spend a couple of minutes to go more in depth on how the camera movements work in a view camera. Let me sketch the camera viewed from the side with the rear and the front standards and a sketch of the bellows. Both standards are aligned vertically. The plane of focus is also parallel to the lens and film plane with the area of acceptable sharpness extending a little bit before and after the plane of focus depending on aperture. The plane of focus can be distorted with a view camera. For example, when tilt is applied to the lens plane, which is illustrated here in this somewhat exaggerated drawing. To understand what happens to the plane of focus, we can apply the Scheinflug principle, which is the geometric rule that describes the orientation of the film plane, the lens plane and the focus plane of an optical system. The Schoenflug principle implies that the line of the film plane, the line of the lens plane and the plane of focus all intersect in the same point. So this means that we can tilt the plane of focus. This is very useful for example if both near and far objects, for example this flower and these mountains, has both to be kept in focus. When stopping down the lens the area of good sharpness diverges like a wedge going from near to far. Applying the same principle, the same effect can be achieved by tilting the rear standard or the film plane in the opposite direction. Again, film plane, lens plane and plane of focus all intersect in the same point and the plane of focus can be tilted. But in the case of the image of the bridge that I was taking, the geometry of the scene was actually opposite and I needed to tilt the plane of focus to span most of the arc above me. Similarly to what was just discussed, this can be done by either tilting the lens plane or the film plane. The example on top illustrates how to achieve proper focus on the whole arc of the bridge by tilting the lens plane while the example on the bottom of the page show how to achieve essentially the same result by tilting the film plane. You can actually see me doing this movement uh, right in this moment. The movement is much more subtle in real life compared to the exaggerated drawings. In practice, some rear tilt was applied to bring in focus the closer part of the bridge, then the lens was refocused on the far part of the bridge by moving the front standard, and then again the rear tilt was lightly adjusted. Repeating this back and forth between rear tilt and adjusting the main focusing knob a couple of times ensures that proper focus is achieved. With both composition and focusing set, all knobs are given a final tightening turn to make sure that nothing moves. It is now time to meter the light. For this, a spot meter can be used. This device measures the light intensity on a narrow area of about 1 degree. With black and white negative film, it is typical to meter for the shadows, placing them one or two stops below mid-gray. In this case, 
I pointed the meter at the dark part of the three branches and dialed in the settings in the spot meter. The settings were ISO 400 film, which was Ilford HP5, and the spot meter reading of 7 EV. The spot meter returned an exposure of 1 second at f32. f32 is a very typical aperture in 8x10 photography, and it gives adequate depth of field with this large negative. This is a view from inside the spot meter. In this example, measuring a light intensity of 8 or 9 EV from the brighter areas of the trees. For comparison, the even brighter areas of the bridge were metered at 11 EV. This will be rendered as very light in the print, while the sky at 15 EV will be rendered as pure white, simplifying the photo. The reading from the spot meter is then transferred to the lens. The aperture is closed down to f32. The timer is set for one second. The shutter is closed and then cocked. A test is a good idea to see if everything is set up properly. Then a cable release is attached to the shutter released in order to avoid shaking the camera while taking the exposure. The shutter mechanism is tested a second time. The film holder is retrieved from its Ziploc bag, where it was stored to protect it from dust and dirt, and it is inserted into the camera bag. At this point, everything is ready for the exposure, and the dark slide can be removed from the film holder. But wait, too much wind. Wind is a constant issue in large format photography, given the long exposure time, which is warranted by the narrow apertures that are always used, or almost always. I personally don't mind a little wind movement in some areas of the photo. I think it gives a very natural look to the image, but too much wind is just a distraction, so I just waited it out. There is always a lull in the wind if you are patient enough. And finally, here is the right moment. About half an hour of preparation for a one second exposure. Time's well spent, I hope. The film holder is going right back to its Ziploc bag and the camera is just taken down. It is usually a good idea to take a second exposure just in case or to bracket the exposures but I'm pretty confident with my metering and anyway, this bridge is so close to my home that I can always come back if needed. So it's time to get back to my bike and go back home in the scorching sun. I see you in the next episode where we will develop this negative. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.